Hi, welcome to the second part of the six part series, series on sustainable agriculture. In this second part today, I'm going to be talking about the impact of the green revolution or the so-called green revolution. The term green revolution refers to the rise of agricultural practices beginning in Mexico in the 1940s. So in, during the war in 19, 1939 to 1945, scientists were investing a large amounts of money in modern weaponry, and these included biological warfare. And in the process, they had discovered different types of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers that had real practical and efficient uses when they were employed in the agricultural sector. So the beginning of the Green Revolution is often attributed to Norman Barlow, who's pictured here, and he was an American scientist interested in agriculture. And in the 1940s, he began conducting research in Mexico and he developed new disease resistant, high yield varieties of wheat. So basically by combining Burlow's wheat varieties with these new mechanized agricultural technologies that I discussed previously, Mexico was able to do, produce much more wheat than was needed by its own citizens. And this led to Mexico becoming an exporter of wheat by the 1960s. Prior to these use of these varieties, uh, the country was importing almost half of its wheat varieties. So the Green Revolution technology essentially spread throughout the world in the 1950s and 60s which really significantly increased the number of calories produced per acre of agriculture. So it was thought that the Green Revolution was then hugely successful. Um, and these technologies were spreading throughout the world. The United States, for example, imported about half of its wheat in the 1940s. But after employing the use of these green technologies, it had become self-sufficient by the 1950s and then by the 1960s, it had become a major exporter of wheat. In order to continue to use these green revolutions technologies to produce more food for a growing population, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation, as well as many government agencies started funding massive amounts of money into research into green revolution technologies. The crops that were developed during the Green Revolution were high yield varieties, meaning that they were domesticated plants uh, bred specifically to respond to fertilizers and to produce an increased amount of grain per acre planted. So what we saw was perhaps the Green Revolution was the, mo the most significant change represented the most significant change to agriculture that the world had ever seen. And there was this huge emphasis on productivity, export markets, but also corporate ownership of farms, which unfortunately had serious environmental consequences. So what were the impacts of the Green Revolution? Well, uh, fertilizers, of course, were a huge part of the Green Revolution and they made the Green Revolution possible. And these, this, these technologies forever changed agricultural practices because high yield varieties developed during this time would only be able to succeed with the help of these fertilizers. It also meant that irrigation was very important. And it, it, it meant that basically large areas of land that were not used for production previously were then able to be used for production. Before the Green Revolution, agricultural, agriculture had been severely limited to areas where there was a significant amount of rainfall, but by using irrigation, water could be stored and then sent to the drier areas, which put more land into agricultural production and of course then increased crop yields. In addition, we saw the development of high yield varieties that meant that that meant there were only a few species to say 
there are only a few species in the beginning of the Green Revolution. And to give you a, a, an idea, in India, before the Green Revolution, there were some 30,000 varieties of rice. But today, there are only around 10 varieties. And these are considered to be the most high yielding types. So by having this increased crop homogeneity through these types, they were also unfortunately more prone to disease and to pests. And, there began, and because there was less varieties of, of the crop to actually be able to fight these diseases off. So in order to protect these limited varieties, pesticide use also grew. And finally, the Green Revolution technologies exponentially increased the amount of food production worldwide, which of course increased birth rates substantially, which, which has had tremendous consequences. So what are the criticisms of the Green Revolution? Well, along with the benefits gained from the Green Revolution, there were several criticisms. The first really is that the increased amount of food production has essentially led to overpopulation worldwide. But the second major criticism is that a lot of places in the world, like Africa, for example, haven't really significantly benefited from the Green Revolution. And the problem, major, one of the major problems surrounding these types of technologies it, is that if there's a lack, lack of infrastructure or if there's government corruption and insecurity, then these technologies have a very difficult time coming about. But perhaps the most important criticism of the Green Revolution has to do with the environment because there was this increased use of fertilizers and, and fer fertilizers and pesticides, which has, has had envir widespread environmental consequences, particularly in terms of pollution in water and soil. So the technologies of the Green Revolution are thus therefore proving really unsustainable because the land that was pre previously used for crops are essentially drying up. And the rates of desertification, particularly in the United States, but in also in other countries, is just really very scary. So the Green Revolution, then it also another really serious criticism of the Green Revolution is the way that it has put the control over food production in the hands of less and less people, and of course, in the hands of corporations. So the family farm structure has virtually collapsed in many places in the world because of this green revolution. And the perhaps the most outspoken critic of the green revolution, Vandana Shiva, talks about this in her book, um, the violence of the Green Revolution. And she looks at the Green Revolution in India and she examines the impacts of monocultures and commercial agriculture and looks at the relationship between this agricultural ecological destruction and also poverty in the country. So while the, while the Green Revolution was largely viewed as a success by many, we can that illusion was entirely shattered in 2008 by what the 2008 food crisis. So what happened in 2008? Well, <clears throat> there was a global economic downturn related to the housing bubble. The there was rising population and of course a demand for more resource intensive food. So things like meat and dairy. There was a rising price of oil, which exasperated the crisis. Declining global stockpiles of food, um, biofuel, so land that was uh, before used for growing crops for food production was now being used for fuel for cars. The Commodity, the market speculation on commodity futures markets also exasperated this problems. And on top of everything, we saw major changes in climate and things like drought, ozone levels, 
soil and water use depletion had serious impacts at the time. So how did countries respond to the food crisis? Well, one of the most significant responses was export restrictions. And it also meant that there was a slowdown in multi multilateral trade agreements related to agriculture. So countries are essentially turning inward. And in some cases, they even ceased to export any produce. I mean, they ceased export activities altogether which of course exasperated the problem because it led to trade wars in international markets. And in some cases, like in the case of Russia where they stopped exporting wheat altogether, this had serious consequences for countries that were depending on the Russian wheat exports, particularly Egypt, which led to a really serious crisis for food in Egypt at the time. The other consequence and or the other reaction to this 2008 food crisis was what is called land grabs. So foreign land acquisition just skyrocketed after 2008. And this meant that there were huge purchases of land made by private companies, by governments, or by wealthy individuals. And there were many implications, of course, for this, for the rural communities and the workers that live in these farming communities that were essentially affected by land acquisitions because some were displaced or they basically had to live off the land as indentured servants. There's also potentially a major issue for long-term food security because governments and private firms can make, they make a lot of money in the short term by selling the land to foreign buyers, but in the long term, it means that they don't have control over their land anymore. And basically that could really threaten the future of their long-term food security. So what we saw after the 2008 crisis was there were long-term supply agreements between states to protect food security in other countries. There was a significant rise in, in, in international emergency relief and food aid. There were new technologies, of course, and increased production. So they were looking to increase, further increase production through new technology to deal with the crisis. Um, but also they mean, there was a maintenance of this productive, productionist and commodified view of agriculture, which is still very much the dominant view. And there was a continued intertwining of the food, fuel, and financial markets. And of course, climate change is not helping the situation. Um, the problems, of course, are growing because of climate change. And there is really a significant drive to try to do address these issues in the 21st century. And so the next lecture will be on climate and sustainable agriculture.